Alexander Chi is the author of the novels Edinburgh, The Queen of the Night, and an essay collection, How to Write an Autobiographical Novel. He is a contributing editor at the New Republic and an editor at large at VQR. His essays and stories have appeared in the New York Times Book Review, T Magazine, Tin House, Slate, Guernica, and Out, among others. He is a winner of the, 20, uh, of the 2003 Whiting Award, a 2004 NEA Fellowship in Prose, and a 2010 MCCA Fellowship and Residency Fellowships from the McDowell Colony, the VCCA, uh, Civitella Ranieri and Amtrak. He is an associate professor. Oh, I'm sorry. He is an associate professor of English and creative writing at Dartmouth College. So, without further ado, please welcome Alexander Chi. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight for this uh, for this special occasion. Um, how many, has any of you here, did any of you here know Sam Park? Okay. Um, I met Sam through a group of my friends in Chicago who uh, all knew him and loved him and spoke of him uh, before I ever met him as just like one of, uh, one of the kindest, nicest, smartest people that you could hope to meet. And when I met him, that was true. Um, he was also very funny. <laughs> um, and, uh, and obsessed with uh, reality television at a certain point in a way that uh, kind of shocked and alarmed me, but which I, uh, I tolerated on social media. <laughs> um, he, was, uh, he was human, in other words. Uh, not a saint, um, but uh, a tremendously gifted writer, and uh, and it was it was important for me also to meet him in this way that uh, that almost overshadowed what our actual meeting was about because uh, if I was the first uh, Korean American queer novelist, he was the second um, to have a book of fiction. And, uh, and so I'd spent a lot of my career essentially waiting to meet exactly him. Um, and so his loss was, uh, as a result, devastating. This event is organized to celebrate his third book, uh, the Caregiver, it is a novel that you can't help but celebrate and mourn the writer at the same time. And maybe the best way to mourn him is to celebrate him. Um, it is an astonishingly uh, economical novel. Uh, the writing has an intensely crisp line to it at the level of style. Um, for all of you sentence mavens in the audience, um, you will not be disappointed if you buy this book. Uh, it is a surprisingly political novel also, which we're going to talk about a little bit tonight. Uh, and. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to fritter it away with explanations, but I will instead turn to my supporting cast, um, these lovely writers who I invited to come out and help me with this task tonight. Daniel K. Isaac is currently in production on season four of Showtime's hit series, Billions, reprising his fan favorite role as trader Ben Kim. He can also be seen in the off-Broadway transfer of the critically acclaimed Barrington production of The Chinese Lady. He recently completed production on the feature film The Drummer, opposite Danny Glover. Will you stand up, Daniel? <laughs> Mr. 
Mitchell Kuga is a Brooklyn-based writer from Hawaii. His work has appeared in The Village Voice, GQ, and Hyperallergic. He's gay. <laughs> He's also awesome. Um, T. Kara Madden is an APIA writer, photographer, and amateur magician. Um, I don't think I knew that about you. Uh, she is the founding editor-in-chief of No Tokens and facilitates writing workshops for homeless and formerly incarcerated individuals. A 2017 uh, Niska Naifa Artist Fellow in Nonfiction Literature, she is the author of Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls, uh, which is awesome, and comes out uh, next April, March, uh, from Bloomsbury in 2019. She lives in New York City and teaches at Sarah Lawrence College. And Eugene Lim is the author of the novels Fog and Car, Ellipsis Press 2008, The Strangers, Black Square Editions 2013, and Dear Cyborgs, FSG 2017. He works as a high school librarian, runs Ellipsis Press, and lives in Queens, New York. <laughs> and he has the coolest glasses. Um, all right. Uh, so we were talking about uh, how we would structure this a little bit, and we're going to try to roughly chronologically go through the book. Um, so I think I'm going to invite uh, Eugene up to the stage first. Thank you, Alex. Thank you all for coming out. Um, the book is political and um, does speak about, I think one of the achievements is it speaks about uh, our frailty as moral animals uh, and it also speaks really um, deeply about parents and children. Um, the part I'm going to read about, read about has a little bit to do with that, but also not. Um, what I, the, the first, I'm going to read two short sections. The first section I chose because um, he talks about this mother who has a job as an actress. And I think, the, I think acting was something that I'm going to guess he really loved because he writes really uh, quite well about it. So this is from early on. Um, the narrator is a, is a girl named, uh, well, she has various ages, but right now uh, her name is Mara, and I think she's eight, and she's talking about her mother. My mother did many things for work, cleaning, waitressing, and temping as a receptionist, but then she was, lar by then, oh no, but then she was largely working in the movies, or rather her, her voice was working in the movies. Inside a foam-covered, soundproof booth, that smelled of cigarettes, my mother dubbed the voices of American actresses into Portuguese. Our fantasies and daydreams came from that country, sometimes in color and sometimes in black and white, and they required a tribute to our essential differences. The man who did the male parts had a paunch and too little hair, but his voice was that of a handsome man, a mellifluous instrument, and he knew just how much breath each syllable deserved. My mother and the man never looked at each other, their eyes bound to the phantom people on the screen in front of them, and I thought of how hard it must be to be in two places at once, inside that bo booth and inside that screen. As my mother juggled different inflections and intonations, voicing women and girls, I wondered how she knew to match their lips. She had uncanny timing and knew exactly when to begin speaking and when to stop. Within a single scene, my mother's silken voice turned throaty or nasal, Ad adulterous or matronly, all these people lived inside of her and took turns emerging from her throat. I was caught between being proud of her and being sad that no one watching the movie later would know who owned that laugh, who owned those cadences. They might even laugh along, not knowing who they were laughing with. My mother was talented, and for the talented mother, a child feels pride, but fear too. Um, so then they go on a walk, and then they go home, and this speaks a little bit about their relationship, and it turns out um, Mara will be uh, a child who parents her parent, and we can talk about kind of the fraught um, choices of parenting that take place in the book. But here's a little bit about their relationship, a little bit more anyway. When we reached the driveway of the Copacabana Palace, my mother stopped and pointed to a group of tourists getting into a van. They were in town for carnival, they looked American with their yellow hair and sunburned skin, their tight shorts and K-9 
cameras around their necks. You know who they are? Asked my mother, lowering her head towards mine, our cheeks uh, brushing against each other's. She pointed at them. They are from America. Everyone knows... Everyone there is rich, even the poor people. When you arrive in America, they hand you a magical plastic card that lets you buy anything you want. My mother grabbed my hand, and we continued walking. She held me firmly as though I was something that a pickpocket could take away from her. But don't worry, my girl. One day I'm going to be rich, too, and live in a big house. A psychic once told me so. What's a psychic? A psychic is a woman, or a man, I suppose they could be men, who tells you what you want to hear in exchange for money. She said without hesitation. I laughed, though I wasn't sure I knew why that was funny. I never knew when my mother was being serious or not, when she was imparting a lesson or just thinking out loud. Either way, from early on, I believed my mother to be special. I suppose every daughter believes her mother to be special somehow. But when I compared my mother to my friends' mothers or to mothers on TV, she really did seem a little different. She didn't keep secrets from me. She swore in front of me. We shared everything. I knew she was beautiful because of the way men on the street turned to stare at her, making me feel that I wanted to hide her, to keep her for myself. She didn't always feel like a mom to me. Sometimes she felt like an aunt who let me get away with things or a friend just visiting for the weekend, one you could be really intense with because you knew they would soon be gone. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to say thank you to thank you to the Asian American Writers Workshop for hosting this and to Alex for having me. Um, the section that I ch I'm going to read is the introduction of a character named Jeanette. And as a reader, I was struck by my desire in this book to see Sam Park, uh, the queer Korean American novelist and his identity made legible in the text um, in a way that I don't think that we expect from white male authors or straight people. Um, and Jeanette comes in and she is this like queer gust of wind. Um, and my, my gay antenna perked up. <laughs> um, I was struck, I think, by the complexity that he lends to the character, especially considering the gender is also unclear. Um, but just the complexity that he lends to the character um, in such a concise way. Uh, yeah. So to set it up, they are talking about Carnival, which is obviously a big event in Brazil. At first, the parade dazzled us, but so much of it was the same. And it took so long to find out who won that my mother usually changed the channel. But one person who really loved Carnival was our next door neighbor, Jeanette. Jeanette was a travesty. I apologize if I mispronounced that to any Portuguese speakers. I don't actually know. Um, I knew what a travesty was because, like most other Brazilians, I knew of the fashion model, Roberta Close, and her famous Adam's apple. Roberta Close was always on TV or on the covers of magazines. If I didn't see her, I could hear her ubiquitous song in the speakers of the stories my mother and I went to. Of the stores, I'm sorry. Everyone thought of Roberta Close as one of the most beautiful women in the world, except for Jeanette, who really hated her. A very personal and deep kind of hatred. And I wouldn't have been surprised if Jeanette told me that Roberta had once killed every member of her family. <laughs> but I appreciated Roberta Close not least because it was through her that I understood Jeanette. And I understood that Jeanette was a man who was able to be as beautiful as a woman. A man who was going out of his way to add some glamour and exoticism to everyone else's lives. Even my second grade self understood what was probably implicit about the travesty and about Carnival itself, that it was one of those things that allowed us to understand who we were, even if that distinction had come by accident, not design. Jeanette often came by to borrow sugar or makeup, transactions that should have taken five minutes, but then she'd stay for hours. My mother loved Jeanette. They had met when my mother was working at a woman's clothing store. Jeanette came in as a man, a rather imposing tall black man with a 100 kilowatt smile. She was awkwardly trying to figure out if a dress was her size without being able to try it on. When the owner wasn't looking, my mother snuck Jeanette into a fitting room. When the owner of the store, who was Armenian, like all the owners of all the stores, found out, 
he fired my mother. He couldn't believe my mother would let a travesty into the fitting room. My mother didn't care. She liked Jeanette. It was Jeanette who later told my mother about the vacancy in her apartment building. Um, uh, the protagonist Mara at 26 is a caretaker to a woman named Catherine who is uh, struggling with stomach cancer and um, as I was reading this book uh, my mom was in town who is also in remission from stomach cancer and my aunt has passed away from it and another aunt has is in remission and my grandmother passed away from it so I was so um, drawn to this relationship and this uh, this character and um, Catherine has been uh, very uh, uh, depressed and bedridden for much of the book, and um, uh, uh, Mara convinces her to venture out to a wedding that she was invited to in the na neighborhood, and that's the passage I'll read. It turned out to be one of those evenings that had no end, as if night were a tall bottle of wine, and because no one could find a cork, it kept spilling and spilling. The band gave way to a popular singer who'd been famous a decade ago and seemed overly excited and happy for the wedded couple. The party spread to the pool, the actual house, the endless slingshot-shaped gardens transmitted by bodies contagious with curiosity and desire. Colored lights one-upped nature. I thought about my mother, what she would think of this party. She'd probably stuff her purse with chocolate truffles, down one glass of champ champagne after another. I could see her standing next to the staff area so she could get first crack at the hors d'oeuvres. Catherine had not been out this late since her diagnosis. I looked around at all that she'd given up. Festivity, merriment, the smiles of strangers. I could see the joys of life beckoning her back. She'd been sick in bed for so long she'd forgotten all the things that she could do. Like observe, or take things for granted, or waste time and space, or walk around in the dark arm in arm with her thoughts. I wondered if anyone else at the party was like her, sick but hiding it, mistaken for healthy. I wondered if one of the people I'd recently honked at in traffic and given the finger to and cursed at had been a sick person like her. I wondered how many times I'd stood in line at the grocery store next to a woman who only had a couple of years left in her. What a pleasure it must be for Catherine to convene amidst the healthy to pass herself off with the guile of a spy, to pretend with everyone else that they were immortal. It occurred to me that it cost her nothing to think like that, whereas being conscious of her impending mortality cost her, well, everything. What if, what if, I, um, what if she saved her sorrows and her grief and her turmoil until then? Sorry, what if, I wondered, Catherine believed herself immortal until the very last minute, the minute right before it all came to an end. What if she saved her sorrows and her grief and her turmoil until then? I could tell how much Catherine wanted to stay at the party, how she had wanted to come desperately all along. She wasn't really doing much, not dancing, not drinking, just standing by the pool watching inebriated people, letting me take surreptitious trips to nearby tables for champagne and tuna tartare. But I could tell her mind was flush with the busyness of life. Life is a party. I'd seen the cliché before in a card sold in the knickknacks and novelty section of a clothing store, the words imprinted in a silly font, or maybe in the 11 o'clock number of some spirited Broadway musical. A party. Some people had to leave in the beginning, some people left in the middle. Some people got to stay until the end. But everyone got to be in it, at least for a part of it. And wasn't that what mattered? And may maybe getting to stay to the very end Blissfully hung over was a luxury rather than a right, a quirk of stamina and genetics and luck. Yes, it would be lovely to stay until the end, but even if you didn't, you got a chance to taste its flavors, to mingle with its strange creatures, to try out new tricks. Thank you. Alex and Asian American Writers Workshop. It's a real honor to be here in this company. I'll read um, the later part of the book, The Last Minute Choice. I was scared of spoilers, but I think 
it's clear up front there are separations that happen in this book. So this is uh, one separation uh, where our narrator Mara is talking about her mother. I thought of myself at age five. Five-year-old Mara had been a skinny little thing with a fat belly. And when Anna had to leave home, even for the briefest of errands, I would wrap my arms around my mother's waist, hanging like a monkey. I'd look up at her, smiling, my head dropping back. My eyes were big and happy and adoring. Back then, my mother had been the sun and the moon and the stars for me. She was the water I drank when I was thirsty, the blanket that warmed me when I was cold. I could not survive without her. I knew that, as little as five years old, and I hung on to my mother with joy. Don't go, I would say, or take me with you, or I want to go wherever it is you're going. I thought of my own big eyes at that age, bigger than the rest of my body. I would jump and fall and jump again, make myself into a ball, then stretch out all legs and arms. I would kiss my mother while smiling and smile while kissing her, and I did think, innocent as I was in those days, that it was really going to be like that forever. My mother's biggest gift had been to teach me how to be a good daughter. She taught me how to be mothered, how to find new mothers, how to be loved by a mother. So even without her, even with her gone, I might still be taken care of. It was as if she knew, of course she knew, that eventually we could be separated that I'd need somebody else to fill her space. Not one person, but maybe many, a series of women for the rest of my life. I would be loved again and again, and it was because she had taught me how. Um, I chose this section, I feel as a, as a writer and reader, there are so many movements against sentimentality and um, writing into emotion, and there's these movements towards uh, witticisms and um, and, and humor and criti critical writing, and this book is so critical and political, but this is so clearly a writer who writes into love, and it's such an act of, of love activism, um, and really going there, and it, it's incredibly moving, so thanks. Um, the complexity in this novel uh, reminds me some of uh, of what I was after when I was a student of writing in my MFA program in the 90s and was being told that my writing was too political uh, because I was writing about activists. <laughs> um, and I remember I went looking for models, and one of them that I found was the work of Mavis Gallant, uh, who would write about characters who had complex uh, ethnicities, uh, complex uh, political backgrounds, um, who were often never particularly from one, just one country. Um, and this is an experience that, uh, that we see, especially in this book. Um, you know, and it's an experience that Sam himself came out of. Um, uh, not that it matters that it's autobiographical, he said, after campaigning against that kind of thinking for a year. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, the section I thought I would read uh, is from, uh, well, it's a car accident. I'll just put it like that. It's from uh, the present time of the novel when uh, Mara is uh, running an errand for her employer. I pulled my car out of the parking spot as it started to rain. I waited for a couple of UCLA students whose backpacks looked like giant cancerous lumps. I turned onto the road and felt a slight bump against the back of my car. The bump, however, was so slight that I ignored it and kept driving. Much to my surprise, the car that bumped me was suddenly by my side, the, the driver gesturing wildly at me as though I was running away from the scene of a crime. I wasn't sure what he wanted me to do. I slowed down a little as I tried to figure it out. The car got in front of me and stopped in the middle of the road. I braked as hard as I could, and I almost hit him from behind, missing his bumper by an inch. The man got out of his car, leaving his lights on, and within seconds was banging on my windshield. 
My window was closed, but I could hear him yelling. Don't you have eyes? You almost caused an accident back there. I'm sorry, I mouthed out of politeness. The doors were locked, but I tentatively cracked the window. Had I really almost caused an accident? Show me your insurance papers, he demanded, his eyes peeking through the slit of an open window. He had a beard, his shirt stretched over his bulging belly, and he looked to be middle-aged, but had none of the warmth and kindness I associated with American men. I could hear in his voice the cheap amusement of someone used to having power over powerless people. And I pictured him using it in a DMV, social security office, or airport customs. I didn't have insurance, and there hadn't been an accident. Hadn't he been the one to hit me? I glanced at the rearview mirror and saw cars piling up in my lane, then some of them abruptly turning the lane next to mine, their tires screeching in annoyance as they passed me. I don't have it with me, I said, rolling the window down just an inch more, a concession to his upper hand. Flecks of rain beat against my warming cheeks. The man stood there, not seeming to mind the rain, his outrage of fuel that made him insensate to the elements. I almost felt like he was enjoying himself. You don't have insurance, do you? He asked in a manner somewhere between self-satisfaction and exasperation. You're all the fucking same. I felt a shiver of fear. The man looked at me like I didn't deserve the benefit of the doubt. I did not budge, did not speak. He pounded my windshield a couple times to accentuate his points. I almost hit you. I would have if I didn't have excellent hand-eye coordination. <laughs> Sorry. And if I hit you, my insurance would have gone up, and that is why people like you should not be on the roads. A woman to boot. The cars behind us now were honking loudly, and a few pedestrians out in the rain glanced curiously in our direction. The sky darkened as if controlled by this man's mood, our faces illuminated by the harsh beam of headlights from cars. Or you're taking this a bit far. Your car is fine, I heard myself saying. I wondered if I could get around his car and leave. Would you follow me? How much anger could one person contain? What's your name, he asked, pressing his finger against the window. I wondered which part of my face his finger floated over from his vantage point. My name, I echoed. I want your name, he demanded. His request dripped with ill will. Why, I repeated. He didn't answer as though the reasons were obvious, but then he said angrily as though he might enjoy the redundancy. So I can report you to immigration, so I can have you deported. What did he consider a fair punishment for me cutting him off on the road? I knew what he meant. An illegal couldn't apply for a driver's license and technically couldn't drive. But we did. We all did. My name is Lucille, I replied. Lucille Ball. <laughs> <laughs> I closed my window all the way, taking back the inch I'd given him. I thought he might hit the windshield again with his fist, but he didn't. The rain started falling harder, and he no longer seemed immune to it. He shook his arms at motorists that honked at us. You will, he finally bellowed. Starting tomorrow, you will have to give me your fucking name. I wasn't planning on ever seeing him again, until I realized that to him, I wasn't an individual, wasn't Mara. I was a class of people, a second-class type of person, and he was going to run into me over and over again. With his promise of future retaliation enough to satisfy his present anger, he got back in his car and mercifully drove away. I made a U-turn and drove in the opposite direction, taking the long way back to Hollywood just to avoid finding myself on the road with the man again. Tomorrow, with everything going on with Catherine, I'd forgotten the election. He was probably one of the crazies just salivating to vote yes on Prop 8187. He was just eager to do his civic duty to screen any brown person he deemed unworthy of sharing his home. I kept the radio off. I was too shaken to listen to music. My heart beat in rapid sync with the rain falling down around me. <sighs> oh, great, more mics. So, uh, A little bit before this, we were talking about um, how the novel is partly about friendships. I guess separations also, now that you mention it. Uh, the way we pick a place to live also, I think is part of it, and how. And maybe how we don't always understand what those choices are right away. 
um, I was really interested in uh, the different things you all saw in it. I think you know one thing that is worth perhaps mentioning is that uh, I think Koreans especially are are vulnerable to stomach cancer, um, which isn't always uh, known to our community. Um, but I just wondered, I guess, what are you guys thinking about it now? You were talking about Prop 187 just before we launched into this. Eugene, do you want to? You mean, what do, we th what do we think about the novel as a whole now? Or, yeah. Um, I was thinking that, um, that one of the achievements of the book largely is that it speaks about uh, these moral moments of moral ambiguity, both in the personal and the political sphere. And in the political sphere, there are these kind of two background things that are happening. Um, there's the military dictatorship in Brazil in the 70s, and, and then in California in the 90s, there's this anti-immigration fervor. Um, and from this, from the point of view of 2018, maybe from the point of view of this room, um, those two, there's a kind of clear black and white, or maybe uh, we have some clarity looking back about what the right side of history was. But what he, what Sam Park, I think, points out is uh, when you're kind of in the heat of these moments or when they're unfolding and there's a good deal of uncertainty, um, people make the wrong choices or people are, uh, it's not so clear, it's not so, and he kind of points out a lot of these moments where people make the wrong choices or are befuddled and he points that out with a lot of compassion, I think. And so that's, uh, I thought that was moving and striking about the book. It's, uh, when he says the election, uh, I think if you, even if you're reading the novel and you know that he's not talking about Trump, you can feel it, you know? And I think there's a way in which one thing the novel does is it shows how the moment we're in now began so long ago um, and in different places and has repeated, yeah, consistently. Um, Mitchell, I loved the section you read. Um, she, there's, this narrator thinks a lot about um, uh, gay men, I think. Um, I, was, I was flipping through and noticed it in another section even just as I was sitting here. Um, uh, but that, that idea of uh, someone who is just adding a little more glamour all along is uh, is an interesting role to think about. Even it's it's like a kind of priesthood, <laughs> or I guess what is it called if you're a priestess? Is it a priestesshood, or is that also a priesthood? Anyway, um, do you want to talk some more about about that? Or? Yeah, I mean, I guess queerness in the book to me does function as like a backdrop of Brazil being a pretty like accepting place for queer people but as we see now it's might change um, I think I was just really struck by the sort of childlike wonder that Mara has for Jeanette as a character and I think that is part of why maybe her identity is not as um, sort of developed in the way that we talk about these things today. But I think that within that sort of messiness, there was this sort of um, you know, like wonder and celebration about um, the possibilities. And I think she also sort of identifies a little bit with her character as just an outsider as well. Um, yeah. One thing that has really uh, struck me about writing, uh, about the 90s that is, and the, all the writing that I've been doing about it really hoping to not write about the 90s at some point. Um, but anyway, I've really been doing it a lot. Uh, and reading this, I was, I was noting again about how little awareness we had back then of trans identity uh, compared to how we do now. And, uh, and how often uh, those members of our community were asked to play along 
in these other capacities and with these ways that we didn't see them. And that, I think, struck me as being a part of that also. Yeah. And also, like, how much of all of those issues are, like, inherently tied to class, right? Because we, we all know of this supermodel actress, Roberta Close. Um, and I also love the fact that she doesn't like her. And I feel like there was, like, this sense of, like, jealousy. Um, but then also just, like, you know, as someone who doesn't have the same privileges, I guess it's sort of the same lens that we apply to someone like Caitlyn Jenner um, in America today. Um, as someone who might not really understand the struggles of like everyday trans people, if that, if she even identifies as trans, I don't know. Daniel. Hi. Hi. So uh, were you thinking a lot about your mom and the women in your family as you read this? So it seems much. like so yeah. much. Yeah. And do you feel like, do you feel like you understood them better from this at all? Totally. I um, Tangentially, one of my uh, friend's dad passed away, and she just put this Facebook post saying, if one more person asks me how I'm doing, I'm going to lose my shit. And, and I just thought, oh, um, and, and the way Sam writes about people who are, um, are ill or are... Um, uh, their mortality is facing them uh, much closer and, and how, how he would rather or how these characters would rather we approach people in that life chapter uh, was so illuminating for me despite the fact that, that in my family um, they, they uh, opt for withholding information rather than um, burdening me with information um, such that, uh, like, I, I didn't know my aunt was dying of cancer until a, a week before where they said, you have to hop on a plane now, and this is what's been happening. And so, so I didn't have the same sort of prolonged experience of, of how to relate to someone who um, was undergoing some, uh, a, a long-term pain and decline. Uh, but uh, the, the compassion and the illumination that Sam brings to those kinds of relationships um, was was really healing and you know painful. I think I went to therapy twice while reading this. Um, so, but also because my mom was here, and so that that's why I scheduled therapy extra. Mm -hmm. You went to therapy in the good way, though, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah in the good yeah. way. Like I have to talk some shit out with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have had some realizations. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, yeah, I think um, there's this remarkable uh, essay that Sam wrote at the end of this novel, um, which functions as a kind of uh, a kind of a goodbye of a kind. I guess um, it was published in the Times just before he died, and uh, it's really moving. And I. Looking at it again, I, and looking at the novel, thinking about the novel, uh, thinking about this idea of caregivers and uh, um, the sort of way that they live in the shadow of uh, other people's needs so often, but uh, burdened so much with their own. Um, I was thinking about how even as, you know, even as he was, uh, reaching the end of the novel and also approaching the end of his life, he was still making this thing for us to have as a way to understand these struggles, taking care of us in a sense. Um, and for yourself, um, this mother-daughter relationship is really powerful to think about and to meditate on and the all-encompassing nature of it. Um, was that something that you focused on or what, what did you find uh, as you were reading it that struck you? Definitely that relationship is just so complicated and fraught and um, like I said, uh, just the love on the page is, 
it's just so admirable to really go there and write into it. And there are so many passages I was trying to choose uh, between when, when our narrator gives us like what the love of a caretaker means um, and how all we want to do really in the end is give ourselves fully to another person. And that's all that matters. Um, and also just being incredibly moved that um, this writer would write from the first person point of view as a young girl and it would be so completely convincing and compelling which is something we don't see every day. Um, I just finished a memoir which is very much about my relationship with my parents as a young girl and this did it better. <laughs> and I was just feeling like wow, like um, just so moved by that and really wishing I, I could have known this writer as a person. Um, I'm not surprised at all to hear about this writer from you and the kindness and generosity of spirit of this writer because that's so clear to me on every page of it. The empathy towards all characters, the rendering of love with all characters. And like we talked about earlier, um, I think even the most atrocious characters in the book um, we feel for them, we feel empathy for them, and that's an incredible feat for a writer that everybody has their complications and everybody makes poor decisions and everyone makes better decisions in the book, and it's incredible. I, I think there's a, there was a point at which I realized, I remember in my, in my life that, um, that my women friends and their relationship with their mothers it just wasn't anything like my relationship with my mother. <laughs> that, that was its own sort of, that it's its own uh, intense category of, uh, of relation. And uh, I think this, this uh, does that tremendous justice. Um, well, I think we are, so we were thinking about whether we would do a Q&A, and actually we don't feel equipped to answer your questions <laughs> about this book um, exactly in the way that a writer who had written it would. So I think, um, I think I would say instead by way of closing, like any, any last thoughts from you all? Um, you wanna, anything we haven't touched on that struck you that you wanna bring up? Get this book. <laughs> it's a page turner. I could not put it down. It made me cry a lot, and it's active, and it's political, and it's, it's this book is an anthem. It's it's so beautiful. Yeah. Before I um I put post its in here. I I s tried dog earing passages that I liked, and then it was sort of every other page. There was just moments of brilliance and and truth and um in. And in, in, in its simplicity and elegance, it, it, it was so, um, you know, when just someone puts words to something you felt or you've never been able to articulate, and yet he, he does that dozens if not hundreds of times in here. And, um, um, and, and my heart uh, just breaks that, it, that we couldn't have more, but what, what a, a selfless and also incredibly, like, selfish way to take space and, and leave this gift at the end um, and to, to live on in that way. And I, I hope you'll be able to share in that journey and, um, and uh, honor this legacy and also uh, like just live, you know? Buy the book. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can't really say it better than that. Um, I think there's also such a clear line of humor throughout the book. Um, it's very funny. Yeah. She, Anna is, or sorry, well, Mara is very funny, and Anna is through her, I think, <laughs> unexpectedly so. Yeah. Um, you kind of get that through the passages that we read a little bit, but yeah, it just made me want to meet this person who this book came out of and watch really bad reality television with them. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if I have much to add, but it is a book about uh, parents and children, about Anna and Mara, but also about uh, the, uh, the this, this ch police chief who's kind of a um, uh, a, tor a torturer, uh, but also a father. And his son is so it's a it's a book about parents and children, and parents and children who have to parent their parents, and and also children who have to love 
these flawed individuals. And uh, that to me was, was kind of the, one of the more moving parts where, um, where Mara, the mother, is kind of the, the main character, but we see her through, or sorry, Anna, the mother, is the main character, and we see her through her uh, daughter's eyes, and we see someone, um, we see that love, uh, that intense love, and then we see the mother do, make the wrong choices, uh, or make, or you know, fuck up a lot as a mother, and, um, but it's a choiceless and helpless love also, and it's a choiceless and helpless occupation as a, as a caretaker, as a caregiver. Um, and so those, that relationship, which is the central one of the book, is very moving. So, um, so that, that uh, I think you'll find it's a worthwhile uh, place to, uh, to, to read. I'm just going to read this uh, short epigraph from the beginning that Sam chose as a way to close us out. I pray you in your letters, when you shall these unlucky deeds relate, speak of me as I am. Shakespeare, Othello. We love you, Sam. Thanks for coming out tonight.